Morning everybody, welcome to the morning service at Burniston and um, trusting that you've had a good week and we pray that you'll be blessed today by the service and we are really thankful that um, the Coopers are going to be leading our children's slot which is fab and um, Reverend Pam Ward, she's going to be bringing the word and the message and Paul is going to, no it's Bruce, sorry, Bruce is going to be bringing the uh, prayers to us and um, so yes you're gonna, have a, you're gonna have a good day and so I want to just uh, bring the service to all to the Lord and ask for his blessing over it and um, so Father God thank you that you bless us and you love us and um, you be with us throughout this service we ask that your Holy Spirit will fill us and that we will hear your word and it will um, bless us and nourish us. Amen. Yesterday I did something new, new for me. I, uh, something I hadn't done before, I made some bread. Yes. Uh, smells good. And oh, actually it tastes good. And uh, believe me, I'm as surprised as you are because baking is not my forte. But I was pleased. And in Psalm 34, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Now the Lord is good and his word, the Bible, nourishes us. I'd never baked bread before. New things. It was something new. Jesus makes all things new. He gives us new starts towards new life. And as today, as we pray the Lord's Prayer together, let's think about those new situations and uh, even new possibilities that are opening up as we emerge from lockdown. If we're a little bit anxious, remember, he is good and he promises to be with us. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So God bless you and enjoy the service. Be blessed by it. And we're going to have our reading um, by Jenny. Good morning. Today's Bible reading is 2 Timothy verses 1 to 8. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of of God. Thanks be to God.
always remember to pray for people when I go to, before I go to sleep. But to today, I always remember to pray for my mummy, daddy, and my two brothers. Also my friends. And I always remember my god, my grandparents, grandparents too, but who today? Hmm, I have an idea. My godparents, Annalisa and Matt, and their two, two children, Michael and Eden, because they're having a baby, and they're coming to us for a visit. That'll be a good way to pray. Dear God, help my godparents, Annalisa and Matt, and their children, and their children, Michael and Eden, and their baby. Keep them safe on their visit to us and help them to, help them to not get the, the, this horrible coronavirus. Please, please God, keep them safe when they come to us.
this is what we have done we do our, we have done some jelly sculptures and this is one of the bible verses and this is before jesus's time and this is the red sea of parting departing and, and so these are these the soldiers over here and then we made it out of jelly um, and um, we made it out of the some gummy bears Mm. You could do it out of jelly, jelly babies, babies um, anything else. like that. And this, so this is the Red Sea departing. These are all the, these are all the soldiers over here, and this it's is the, the, lights the, the, the middle. It's the lights in the middle, and this is Moses um, leading them out. And you can do this at home, just a fun activity and. It's just a little, only all you have to do is make some jelly and get some jelly babies or gummy bears. That's our departing of the Red Sea jelly. Hello. Imagine, if you will, a being in isolation. All freedom curtailed, as though you're locked in. Imagine not being able to meet with friends or relatives or neighbours. Imagine what it's like not to be able to have a chat or a share or a hug. But then you don't need to imagine, do you? Because we've experienced very similar to that during the pandemic lockdown. But so did Paul, but in a very different way. He was in lockdown. He was in a Roman jail, probably a dungeon, with only one person allowed to visit him, uh, acting as scribe. We think in this occasion it was Luke. And here he is writing this very last letter to his dear friend, Timothy. As we've been thinking about prayer in various forms, strictly speaking, today, this is not a prayer, but it is a letter that Paul has sent to Timothy that's full of the content of his prayer. And so we're going to be looking at that content to this young man, this Timothy, uh, full of life, who is almost like a son to Paul. So Paul is writing, and one of the things he first does as an ingredient of his prayerful letter is thankfulness. Thankfulness for Timothy, for he who he is, his youthfulness, his exuberance, the delight of, of this young man with his Christian faith. The next part of thankfulness is their love for each other, good, honest, Christian, brotherly love for one another. And in fact, Paul refers to how much joy he would have if only he could see Timothy again and be with him. Do you remember what it was like when you and I could first enjoy the initial easings of lockdown and be with that first person to see their smile again, to see them face to face? That's the joy that Paul and Timothy hoped to have, but sadly were denied. The third part of thankfulness was for Timothy's faith. A lively, exuberant, joyful faith. A faith no doubt gleaned partly from his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. But as far as we can tell, Grandma Lois would have been a Jewess, brought up in the Jewish faith. And no doubt she would have passed on much of this to her daughter Eunice. But we believe that Eunice was married to a Greek. And it may be that as time went on, along with her Jewish faith... The daughter, Eunice, Timothy's mum, would also have gleaned something of the Christian faith. These new followers of the way, this man called Jesus the Christ. But of course, when it comes to Timothy, Timothy cannot just rely on his grandma or his mother's faith. He has to have a faith that is his own. And Timothy has chosen to become what today we call Christian. But that goes for you as well. And me. We cannot simply catch a lift on our parents' or our grandparents' faith. 
It may be that you and I look back in time and we remember perhaps parents or grandparents taking you to Sunday school. Perhaps we remember sitting in long sermons occasionally as we got a bit older and maybe gradually drifted or settled into a fairly comfortable relationship with Christianity. But there comes a time when the faith must be our own. I remember for me it was my maternal grandparents. They were farmers, primitive Methodists. Simple faith that went deep, deep down. Not least after they'd heard the evangelist Billy Graham speaking at a rally in the 1950s. And although I accompanied my maternal grandparents uh, where they went to the farming community local chapel on a Sunday evening, there'd be no more than a handful there. And certainly the act of worship did nothing to encourage young ones. But it was when my grandparents sang and they sang their praises to Jesus as though their faces were glowing and their hearts were going to explode with joy. And I remember thinking, I want to be like that. But it wasn't until my 30s that eventually the Christian faith became my own. So thankfulness, thankfulness for who Timothy is, thankfulness for his, his faith, and thankfulness for the loving relationship there was between them. So the second point I'd like to make is about encouragement. And the first encouragement that Paul gives is that Timothy should fan into flames the gift that God has given him. Of course, that goes for you and me as well. And it may be someone watching today will think, Pam, I don't have a gift that God's given me. I'm sorry, but that's just not true. You will have a gift. You just may not have recognised it yet. It might be hospitality, readily making a cup of coffee for a neighbour who needs someone to care. It might be a listening ear to listen and care without judging. There's a thousand and one different gifts that God can give. Whatever it is, you and I must fan into flames that gift that we're given. I think it's helpful to think of fanning into flames. It reminds us perhaps of an open fire with the embers glowing red and hot. We could readily welcome a pan of water in which to boil something or cook something to give out warmth and welcome. But of course, if untouched the embers would suddenly turn cold, cool, black, grey, and turn to ash, no longer useful for heat or light or welcome or cooking. It can be like that with our gifts, if we don't use them. And so Paul said to Timothy, fan into flames the gift that God has given you, and we should do that too. The second part of encouragement is about encouragement at a difficult time. Timothy is a young man and he is a pastor of a fledgling church at Ephesus. And many of them look at him and think, you're too young. Where's the wisdom? Where's the grey hair? Why should we listen to you? But we take that view at our peril. It wasn't only Timothy that was a young man in the Bible. Jeremiah too thought he was much too young and couldn't possibly speak for the Lord. And Josiah, a young king God had predicted would be his man to rule his people, was only six years old when he came to the throne. If we come closer to home, and I think a burnished Methodist church, and we think of our youngsters there. Yes, there are those who help with fundraising. There are those who help and make music in the worship group. There are those part of a big team that go every two or three years to South Africa to help with a Christian charity to build much-need housing. Or perhaps individuals, perhaps teaching in Guyana. One went to do voluntary work in China. Others have been to Calais to help with the refugees. Let us never look down on the young ones whom God is richly inspiring. So, youthfulness, but the other thing was also struggling with suffering for the gospel. Paul knew what he was talking about. I can't begin to imagine all he's gone through, but we do know, apart from shipwreck and having a poisonous snake attached himself when he'd recovered from the shipwreck, we also know he'd had the 39 lashes umpteen times, just one more than the 40, which was not allowed. 
and umpteen times in prison. He knew what suffering was, and yet did he complain? No, he stood strong and continued sharing the gospel because he trusted in his Lord and Saviour. I wonder if some of you have a really good memory. You might recall when 18 months ago I sent a request around the whole circuit asking for prayer for two Christians in Cambodia. One was a friend called Catherine from West Brom Methodist Church, a faithful Christian and a steward. She'd gone for her third time to do some voluntary work in Cambodia with the street children, the poorest children, some of whom lived in sewers. She also spent time with young families, some families who were struggling. She went out for the third time and met somebody she'd seen before, Steve, also a very committed Christian. He'd usually gone with his wife, but on this occasion he was alone. His wife's mum was ill and she couldn't go. So Steve and Catherine worked sometimes side by side and sometimes separately with Cambodia's neediest children. Towards the end of their stay, shortly before they were due to return home, Catherine was going to call on Steve when her friends gathered her around the corner and said, No, careful, careful, the police have come. They're taking him away. And they did. So Catherine went to speak to the police authorities to try and see if she could secure release or, or some, some help. At that point, when Catherine couldn't be contacted for 48 hours and we had no news of either Catherine or Steve, it was that point that I asked all Methodists in our area to pray. Thank you so much for you that did. I know some of you felt an embarrassment and a discomfort. Not sure. No smoke without a fire, you thought? Especially as Steve was then convicted of having been a paedophile. Inappropriate behaviour with some of the children. Catherine was sure that wasn't the case. Secured him a lawyer and did all she could. But he was imprisoned. It was until a trial was fixed. And he'd been warned that sometimes in Cambodia... This could be 24 years. They needed our prayers. But our prayer and God's will worked. Because to cut a long story short, Catherine was released after 48 hours, given her freedom, continuing to do all she could to visit him, taking fruit and nuts to supplement the meagre diet, and she managed to smuggle in a very small Bible. At the end of the time, he was basically found to be innocent. The situation was he'd been accused by a woman who was a drug addict. She was so desperate to get money to support her problem uh, that she just begged for money for any reason whatsoever. But when she turned to Steve and Catherine, what they'd done was to provide the food and the baby powder that was needed for the infant. They supplied everything they could, but not the money. She was so fr frustrated and angry that she reported them to the authorities and accused him of this treacherous act and even bribed some of the local teenagers to corroborate her story. Eventually, it transpired in court, after only nine months, that in fact it had been a pack of lies. And in fact, her husband, also in prison at the same point, admitted that she told him so, and she'd done it before anyway, anything to feed her habit. So why am I telling you this? What does this possibly have to do with Paul being in prison for his faith? If it wasn't for Steve's Christian faith, he wouldn't have gone to Cambodia. But there he was, in a room full of other Cambodian men, all next to one another on a floor. And I think you may be able to see a picture now that comes on your screen showing you how closely packed all the prisoners were together. Steve was there among that group in a room full of Cambodian men. But as Catherine had managed to smuggle in that little Bible, he was allowed to walk around among the men to talk to them about the Bible, about his faith, about Jesus Christ, how Jesus too had been suddenly apprehended, arrested, roughed up by the police, accused, charged and ultimately killed on a cross, yet rose again. 
By the time he'd finished talking, shortly before he left, having been, in our language, acquitted, many of the men were in tears at what he told them. Two things come out of this, truly remarkable. The first is that no one had ever been known to have been allowed released from a Cambodian jail in under a year. No one, ever, except for Steve. And Cambodian men never cry, never show their feelings, never, ever. But they'd cried when they'd heard about Jesus. God works mightily through Steve, and we thank God that he's back at home with his family. And I don't know about Steve, but I know Catherine is even thinking she might go back again to Cambodia in spite of that. But God also worked mightily through Paul, not only for Timothy's benefit on that occasion, countless others, but for us too, for we have most of the letters that he ever wrote. And why? Why would Steve and centuries before Paul be so full of courage when faced with such a challenge, suffering for the gospel? Because they, like us, stand on the rock that is always there. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So whatever you're going through now, and it may be that's the COVID-19, it may be the absolute fear of, of going out again and meeting others. It may be something quite different. But whatever it is, you are on the rock. And yes, your feet may hurt because the rock feels a bit rough and the water may be lapping at your feet and your fingertips are sore and your knuckles are white. But the rock is firm and we can carry on clinging to the rock and the rock will not let us go. Our Lord, our rock, is always there and most especially through suffering for his gospel, for his church, for fellow Christians, for Christian love. This has sometimes been called this Second Timothy, Second Letter to Timothy, Chapter One, which we've been thinking about today. It's sometimes called the deathbed blessing, because it was the very last letter Paul would ever write. It was only a matter of months or maybe weeks before he would be executed in Rome by Emperor Nero. It would be the last letter he wrote, the last time he could send his prayerful blessing to Timothy or anyone, the very last. In about four weeks' time, we shall be saying goodbye to Reverend David Perry, who's been with us at Burnison Methodist Church. And perhaps, if I may, on your behalf, I'd like to pass on to him what Paul passed on to Timothy. First, our thanksgiving for who David is, thanksgiving for his Christian love he's brought us and shared among us, thanksgiving for his great faith, deep and rich, thanksgiving for everything that David has been to us over the last two years. Secondly, I'd like to pass on encouragement from us all. I'm sure you'll join me in this encouraging him to keep going and fanning the flames of his wonderful, powerful testimony and story and commitment to Jesus, inspired and shared with all who he meets. We pray too for concerns for his future. The concerns that just as Paul wanted Timothy to keep going and keep strong, we pray that David will too that he and his wife will enjoy some time together in whatever we describe as retirement in the Methodist Church. I'm not sure it quite works like that. But whatever the new phase is in his life, serving Christ as Lord and Saviour, we pray that the Lord will be with him and bless him. So David, I hope you'll accept this rather ad hoc blessing. But also to anyone else who is listening and watching today, I hope that any prayer you have for another will be a blessing to them. Thank you for listening and God bless you. Thank you, Pam, for your message. 
Well, we're going to enter into a time of prayer now. And we remember that prayer is when we come to God and we have permission and the freedom to let go of the limitations that we so often place upon God so that we can open ourselves to every possibility as we allow ourselves to engage with the greatness and the infinite potential that there is in coming before the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pray in this way. We're going, I'm going to put some images up on the screen. Uh, the first one will be with respect you know, to the world. The second with respect to the church. And then we will have some time for personal prayer. But rather than me praying, I'm just going to leave 30 second gaps in between each to give space for you as you're inspired to pray to God regarding these various subjects. And then at the end, I'll close it all with prayer. And so let's pray for the world. Let's pray for leadership. Let's pray for peace amongst the nations. And anything else that you feel inspired at this time to pray for. Let's pray now for the church and for those who are in difficult situations around the world, facing persecution, difficulties, feeling silenced in so many ways. Let's pray for them that God will give them courage and strength to persevere through all their difficulties. And now let's pray for our own church here in Burniston. Let's pray for the witness of the church in the community. And let's also pray for the ways in which we have to readapt to the new circumstances that have come our way. And let's also pray now for any individuals in our family, friends that we know, uh, especially Chris at this time, anybody that God places upon our hearts, let's hold them in our hearts. And when we hold them in our hearts before God, God is holding them in his heart too heart of our own hearts, whatever before. Still be our vision, thou ruler of all.
And so, Lord, we gather all our prayers before you as one and thank you for this privilege of coming into your presence. And also, thank you for the joy that we have in knowing that our prayers are a fragrance to you. And now we pray for ourselves and we pray for the week ahead. And we pray that you'll give us courage. You'll give us the ability uh, to persevere through suffering. You'll give us a spirit of gratitude, thankfulness for all the good things that you have given to us. And above all, we pray that you'll confirm all that we do with your loving presence, so that each day, wherever we go and whatever we do, we will be sharing you with others in our actions and in our words. We gather all these things to you now in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. And now we'll close by saying these words of scripture together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>